We're here with Chase Cromo of the Cromo Home Group and uh, my little buddy over here. But Chase, being a dad of five, this is like no different for you, right? No, not at all. Crying babies, you're used to it? Yeah, easy peasy. <laughs> all right, so dad of five, you are out here supporting your family um, with real estate. How long have you been in the industry for? Nine years, I think, is where we're at now. Like, I literally started legitimately, um, like, j jumping into using my license, I think, in 2015. So, we're, t yeah, coming up on nine years. Holy cow. So. And in that area, so you got started as an agent. What was, like, the first thing that you did to get your name out there as a real estate agent? Because a lot of people knew who you were already in your community. Honestly, I try to take advantage of uh, our family name. We've been in the community for, well... We were, we're from East County and my, my grandfather's from East County. Uh, they had a very reputable business at the time. Yeah. And so I tried to capitalize on that. I did the same thing when I um, owned my detail business, right? When I used to clean cars for a living. Um, I used the company logo when I went to business doing detailing. So I always tried to play off of our last name because it, you know, there's not a lot of crumbles out there and especially in East County, if yeah. they're, if the name gets brought up, then they know which family you're talking about most yeah. of the time. So, so if an agent's getting into real estate for the first time and they want to capitalize, maybe they don't have the Cromwell name, but reaching out to your sphere and stuff like that, was it awkward to be like, hi, I'm now not detailing cars. I'm now selling your biggest investment. No, I did that like right off the bat. That's why I try and preach to my agents. Right. So right when I, um, I got my, I started working my license. I would sit down at my desk at um, the old brokerage and I would call people that I hadn't talked to in probably eight years, honestly, since high school. And it was uncomfortable because they would call me back and be like, Hey, I haven't talked to you in a while. And I, <laughs> I would have to be like, Hey, yeah, I'm just working really hard. You know, I'm trying to um, build my real estate career and this is where I'm, I was told to start. So I'm calling everybody I know, everybody that's in my phone book. And I'm just letting you know that I, help people buy and sell houses. And it, I, obviously I wasn't even as confident. So I'm sure my voice was chattery. I'm sure I was super awkward on the phone to talk to at the time. Um, but I uh, definitely persevered and pushed through that. And I did that multiple times in my first year, kept calling the same people that hadn't heard from me in eight years until I had a few rejections and people frustrated. And then, you know, it started spilling over from there. Yeah. So. so just honest conversations. I'm in real estate now. I'd love for me to be your resource when you want to buy or sell. I mean, even today, like I have my database, right? That's built up from over the last few years and that I've been doing this, um, this job. And I still call my clients and I say, Hey, um, I just wanted to check in with you, see how everything was going. Obviously, uh, you know, I still do real estate. But I wanted to see if there's anybody that you know that needs my help, um, that could use the same service that you guys uh, took advantage of and see if I can help them right now today or in the future. So you're doing a hundred transactions a year. Yeah. And you're still calling your sphere and you're still going back to the fundamentals. Yeah. So my personal transaction, I I'll transact, I'll probably pen close 75 myself. I think maybe That's 80 huge. this year. Um, um, my personal transaction, I don't hit a hundred, but as a small team, we'll hit over a hundred this year. But yeah, I, I still take it right back to the basics. Um, Phone calls, text, I throw a lot of events and I'm very, very plugged into the community that I live in. Yeah. A lot of sphere of influence events. I mean, I know that we're up at yeah. the Cromwell Home Group, you know, once a quarter. Mm -hmm. So is that kind of what you're doing for your sphere right now? So, you know, it's funny. My The first party that I had at my new office, I only invited my clients and we had a few, we probably had 250 come. Well, what I started to do, like we had people in the community seeing our events and they're like, oh my gosh, we would love to join you. And I just thought, oh, well, I'm just going to start making this in the community event, right? The more yeah. the merrier. So um, Christmas last year, I mean, we had to have a few hundred people come to our Christmas event because, and that was... That's people in our database, that's our sphere, and then that was people from the community that we invited in. And now they know who we are, they know what we're about, or, you know, we do things for people um, out of the goodness of our heart, we don't do it for business, but, you know, obviously um, we're going to get paid for repetition and doing what we do, but um, at, in the same token, like, uh, it's very important with me and my background and my belief that I'm plugged in to help people who, yeah. you know, need help. Sometimes I get paid for it. Sometimes I don't. I don't really care. Do you work with a lot of clients that are actually relocating? I do work with a lot of people that are relocating. I think last year we did about 30% of our business was relocated, relocation. Um, a lot of people to Arizona. I can't even tell you how many people I moved to uh, Tennessee, Oklahoma, 
Um, a couple to Texas, obviously, you know, where that the, yeah. the waves going out of California was kind of the, the trend for a while. Um, but so what we do in those situations is obviously there's, there's lots of things to take into consideration when you are selling kind and you're trying to move part. out of state. Like, you know, there's contingencies that you can add into the contract. There's uh, rent back periods that you really need to add in for uh, taking into consideration the time to move out. And then, yeah. you know. You have to lessen the risk a little bit because things can happen in a transaction on the last day, last two days, which could, you know, you got your movers scheduled for day of closing and then all of a sudden you get a one week delay oh. and now you're in a scramble and the movers can't change their date and you owe them the money. It's It can literally be a mess. So if you're not prepared properly for um, executing the uh, relocation out of state, you could really um, have like a really unpleasant experience. I can tell you that. What are like some like few quick little things that you do for your clients differently to prepare them for that out of state move other than just contingencies or a flexible moving date. So I always, number one, um, if they don't already have a real estate agent partnered with out of state, I always find them somebody that I align with personally yeah. that I can trust, um, that I, that I can align with, with my business and knowing that, Hey, they're going to take care of you the way that I take care of you. And then, so we can kind of start this uh, circle chain of communication um, where uh, they know what's going on, I know what's going on over there, and then if something does happen, I can call that agent that they're working with and say, hey, here's a hang up here, make sure you tell your sellers over there, we got everything all right, we've got it handled, but we could have a couple day delay. So that's one thing we do. Two is we always um, make sure that the sellers have a place to go when we close, and their belongings, okay. because the very last day, the last thing you wanna be doing going across the country is moving crap out of your house. Yeah. You don't. You want you want it loaded. You want it ready. You want to put the keys in the car. You want to go. So those things have to be planned out. So that's why uh, it's important when my clients move out of state, I'll do whatever it takes to get a rent back for them um, so we can close escrow. The money can hit their account. They can, they can use that money to pay for the movers. Yes. Uh, they have the security to know like, okay, I can move now. I can go out of uh, state safely, know my deal is closed, and we're in a good spot. So that's yeah. probably the most important thing that we work on. That's huge. Yeah. So with the mass exodus happening, are you also seeing like a huge influx of listings that are going to be hitting the market soon? Or oh, man. I, no joke, this week I've had three calls from sellers who are moving out of state. Wow. Just this week. So um, this year alone I've probably moved out. 10 people out of state. I just closed escrow on one yesterday. They went, they went to Texas. Like it's all the time. Like yeah. I'm, a lot of my sellers, cause I work with primary sellers. Like I probably 80% sellers, 20% buyers at, yeah. at, in this market at least. But, um, yeah, so, uh, we're just, you know, we're, we're used to the reload stuff. So let's talk about this. If people are selling here and they're not relocating, they want to buy up. What are some ways that you're working with your clients? Because you have to have, you know, every, your ducks in a row for selling and then your ducks in a row for buying. So people, the house isn't overlapping. How are you handling That's that? That's the scariest situation, I think, for uh, sellers to be in in this market because it's so competitive. Oh, yeah. There's no inventory. So you got to really have an agent that's going to really turn up the heat for for them and, and hit the ground. So what I do is we find neighborhoods that they're looking for. I start prospecting them really hard. What does that mean, prospecting a neighborhood? For we'll flyer drop. We'll call. I'll call all the agents that are big in those areas. Say, hey, do you have any off-market um, opportunity for us? I mean, obviously, we know when we when we come in as a contingent buyer, we've got to pay a premium. Yeah. Um, however, if we can get under contract, most of the time our clients are willing to do that. If we don't have to compete with the buyer. Um, another way is, is, you know, we list a lot of houses. So a lot of times we can match make people into the houses that we have coming up. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, right now we're, I'm dealing with four properties where I'm selling and they're buying. And the, the process that we normally take, um, or the, yeah, the order that we normally take in those situations are, okay, we get pictures ready. We get the house prepped for the market. The buyers start looking before we hit the market. And then once we go live, they know while we are looking for a buyer for their house, they need to be looking actively for, for a house for to replace it. Once I find their their buyer, we have a contingency in play 
um, that is for sellers to find a replacement property. That way they can't be left homeless if we don't find anything within yeah. a certain period of time. Most of the time we can find it and uh, or we can ask the buyers to extend that period for us. Yeah. And then once we find the exact home, um, we are still contingent um, buyers, but we will have already been in escrow. So we're less risky to accept. And then we, I have that conversation with my buyers um, slash sellers that, hey, you got to pay the premium um, in order for them to see past and to take the risk of I the a buyer. Yeah, of being the contingent buyer. The Cromwell Home Group's motto is earn it. Yeah. My shoot is right here on my leg. It's tattooed right here. <laughs> All right. Let's talk about that. Why is your motto earn it and how do you live that out every single day? Oh, man, you can you can earn everything, right? Nothing's given to us. I mean, I'm a father. That's what I teach and instill in my kids every day. Like, we're not entitled to anything. So, and, and that goes for us uh, for working. You want to offer something that, you know, somebody else can't give them. Yeah. And for me, I am I come from the construction world. I can ro uh, roll up my street or sleeves. I drive tractors. I, you know, I know how to uh, lay pipe and work on houses. I've built houses. So my earn it motto is like, you know, we're getting a paycheck. We're charging these sellers to uh, give them a premium service. What can I do um, that's even more premium than what anybody else offers, right? Yeah. So just going the extra mile. Um, and, uh, there's, I can go into that topic I, really deep, but yeah. Over you, you always under promise and over deliver. I mean, yeah. you've, we've done real estate transactions together and personally you've done a lot of things for us, but I see you also do it for your clients. I see it on social media. You're in work boots yeah. and then you'll show up to these multi-million dollar listings and there's work boots and dirty jeans because you know, you're going to get in the backyard doing something or up on a roof looking at something. Man, uh, I think it was this year. Uh, I tore somebody's driveway out and re-poured it concrete for them. <laughs> like, it took me two days. And I, I literally, that was one job where I was just like, what the heck did I get myself into? <laughs> but I still did it. And I sold the house for more than, you know, the surrounding comps did. But I put in so much work in that house. I, I've i moved boulders for people. I've gone and uh, um, dug trenches for people to do sewer tie-ins at their house. Like, I, you name it. I mean, aside from doing those kinds of things, like even being a buyer's agent, earning your pay is not just sending an email, an automatic email to your client saying, hey, this house is just hitting the market because the MLS just popped it off. We, I will literally print out 250, whatever, thousand flyers, and I will go pass it out and try and start as many conversations in a neighborhood where my client wants to be until I find that one seller. Even if the seller doesn't want to work with me, I at least know that that house is coming on the market. So then I go back, I game plan with my buyers. I'm like, hey, this is going to hit the market. This is what I think they're going to expect. We should come in at this. And then we've I've already set rapport with these guys. I've already worked hard. We've already gotten this far. So we do like a lot of different ways of earning it in our business. So. And people respect the hustle with you. Yeah, yeah. You work with a lot of agents, and you have a great name in the industry because you truly are out there hustling and doing it for, not it's not for yourself. It's not to be driving these flashy cars. It's it's for your family, and it's to better your community. I drive a work truck, so. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't care about that stuff. But I love it. Even with sellers, like, you got to go out there and, and, um, and earn that work as well, like going out and giving the the CMAs to sellers that aren't expecting to sell. Maybe it's just putting your name out there for business in five years. We get good feedback from that kind of stuff. A paycheck you know? tomorrow is still a paycheck. Yeah. I love it, Chase. Thanks for joining us in the studio today, and thanks for uh, helping put the baby to sleep. Thanks for having me. <laughs>